And a very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lauren, and thank you for joining us for One on One. On this program, we look at some of the programs of the National Assistance Board. Joining me is the coordinator of the Community Elder Care Companion Program at the NAB, Mr. George Griffith. Mr. Griffith, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Let's first start by looking at some of the services that the NAB offers. And I know that your relationship with the NAB stretches back to the 80s when you were the deputy director. Yes. Yes, that goes back to 1984 in my case. Mm -hmm. But the NAB is now more than 40 years old. And when I was there as assistant director, I went into the organization really to work specifically with the home health program. In those days, it was necessary to decentralize the program to ensure that rural Barbados benefited from the service. In those days as well, it was a question of recognizing that getting from one house to another, because as you know, the home helpers, as they were called in those days, um, had to go to several houses and they relied on the buses. Mm -hmm. and some people walk. And in order to get efficiency and higher levels of productivity, it was necessary to restructure the program so that the assignments followed designated bus routes so that you could get onto a bus and get off and get on again to ensure that you could reach the clients that you were supposed to reach in those days. In those days as well, there were many more services. Um, we had, for instance, the housing welfare program persons who were poverty stricken and in need of um, housing upgrade. The housing welfare program was attached to the National Assistance Board. So once the referrals came in, the officers went out and they did the assessments. Then it was recommended that person A or person B needed either to have a house repaired or in some cases a new house. So the housing welfare program, because it was part of the National Assistance Board, it permitted a speedier um, availability of services to the people who really needed the services. That housing welfare program also addressed the area of ramps for persons who were older, people who were confined to wheelchairs or may have had an amputation or mm -hmm. suffered the debilitating effects of um, arthritis. Those persons had ramps built so that they could access their houses and get out into the community. It also addressed um, something that is still plaguing Barbados, maybe not to the same extent, but still it is an unfortunate situation where seniors are still living in houses without any waterborne systems. And up until recently, it came across a situation where a person had to literally crawl out of the house down the step into the yard to make use of uh, toilet facilities. And of course, the government is committed to eradicating all pit toilets from Barbados, but it has taken some time. And sometimes they exist and people don't know. Mm -hmm. Or you eradicate it in one community, and then for one reason or another, one might pop up someplace else. So it was, that was the housing welfare program. Then it was the assistance in care program. The assistance in care program provided a number of household uh, implements like the pots and the pans and the stoves and sometimes a bed or a mattress, something that we take for granted. But a number of persons still did not have those facilities. So the assistance in kind program addressed that issue. And we still have today the Clyde Gallup Center, a shelter for men, and that is in Hinesbury Road, the old Hinesbury School. And if you pass there now and you see that, you'll be impressed. It is brightly painted. I had the, the, the um, experience of seeing one of the um, persons who used the center doing the painting mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, this is under the direction of Mr. James Cummings, a very senior social worker who is involved in that program. So basically that is what happened in those days. And now you still have the home help service, still soldiering on. And quite a number of Barbadians, hundreds of Barbadians, elderly persons and so on, make use of the 
home health service where persons can go into the homes. And like it was in the beginning, um, you assisted people with, with some cooking and some scrubbing and some washing and grooming and, and, and those kind of things. People are still doing that. And if you had the opportunity to visit some of those elderly persons or disabled persons in the community, they would tell you that had it not been for that home health service, they do not know what life would be like for them. And sometimes as a society, we take these services for granted, but for persons for whom the service means almost everything, their only means of survival sometimes. So that um, statutory corporation is still alive and well, and it is still bringing a much needed service to the public of Barbados. You mentioned that hundreds of people benefit from the home help uh, yes. program, for instance. How, how many hundreds are we talking about? Well, I think the home health service now would care to almost a thousand persons. Okay. You're still in Barbados. And what's the criteria like? What, what is the criteria in terms of people be, being eligible for the home health okay. assistance? Sometimes uh, individuals can call the National Assistance Board and indicate that they would need the service. Sometimes um, social workers or persons from the welfare department might call and make a referral. Sometimes the Queen Elizabeth Hospital might do it. Doctors might do it. Or any person in the society, maybe a pastor or preacher or schoolmaster, anybody who is aware that there is an old lady or an old man someplace who is still struggling to maintain independence and still trying, but Sometimes the things that we could do when we were younger and more mobile becomes very challenging. Sometimes it is a case where um, the house might be a bit bigger than the person can cope with. Uh, sometimes it's a case where the structure is not properly maintained and then it becomes a danger. But when the home helpers go in and they recognize that these situations exist, then they can make a referral. Um, through the social workers, of course, to, to bring about some relief to those persons. And is the NAB meeting that demand for the services? It is meeting that demand. I should mention as well that parliamentary representatives uh, refer persons as well. So any member of the public can refer a person and then it would be the responsibility of the social workers or the um, supervisors or team leaders, as they're called, to go out and uh, conduct that visit, have a conversation with the person or the person's next of kin to ensure that the person is aware of the range of the services to be offered and that they are willing to accept the service. I know of situations where persons are referred, but they are reluctant mm -hmm. because persons, as, as we get older, we still feel you have prayed. that we can do it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I, I say we, because I'm a youngish senior citizen. <laughs> now, you do have a new program which you are responsible for. You recently rolled out the Community Elder Care Companion Program. Yes. Tell me what this program is. All right, this program is complementary to the Home Help Service. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we have had the Home Help Service and they focus on those bigger things, so to speak. The Community Elder Care Companion Program um, Elders are categorized, there are three main categories. The first is that the person must be living alone and in need of this level of assistance. The second is that the person can be living alone, not, sorry, the person can be living in a household mm -hmm. with other persons, but that person is left alone for the greater part of the day right. because persons go out to work, as the case may be, and the person is still there. And thirdly, it can be a person who is considered uh, vulnerable. This could be a younger person who may have suffered, uh, may have experienced an accident and therefore that affected mobility. It could be a person with uh, an amputation, a person who suffered a stroke, or any of those combination of uh, very disadvantageous situations that could arise. And those persons are eligible for involvement. And as was the case earlier, uh, referrals can be made and once referrals are made the supervisors in this case will go out 
and again do that interview, fill out this uh, interview form. And on completion, it is evaluated and it is determined then how many uh, days of assistance the person might need, uh, whether or not the person is in, interested in the service. And in some cases, some persons are not able to speak uh, effectively for themselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is a, a next of kin or a helpful person in the community who can speak on their behalf. And for this community elder care program, it is divided along constituency lines, so to speak. It is non-political, but it is divided so that each constituency would have um, an area demarcated. The workers have maps so that they know exactly where they're going. There are 15 supervisors so that each supervisor will supervise two constituencies and the persons are assigned and they will go out. Now they deal with issues like addressing isolation and loneliness. You'll be amazed how many people in Barbados are lonely and isolated mm -hmm. and sometimes depressed yeah. and feel that there's no one there for them. Even when they're living in a household with other persons who are out to work for a whole day. And a person might be there from 7.30 or 8 in the morning until 5 or 6 in the evening. I'm talking with, about persons with mobility challenges, a person who cannot quite get around. A person might be in a wheelchair, might have to use a walker, might have to use a cane, might be on crutches. A person might have had an amputation or double amputations. And therefore, simple things like getting up and going to the refrigerator or the tap for a glass of water or making their way to the bathroom or to, the, to pre have an, a meal prepared. That is a mighty challenge. And there are some persons who would remain there all day mm -hmm. without the ability to get to the bathroom, without that glass of water or that cup of tea. This program is there for them. And the social stimulation activities involve sometimes casual conversation. Uh, we know, given my experience in medical and psychiatric social work, how difficult it is for a person to be at home for a whole day and no one to, to exchange words with. And therefore, the companions engage them in conversation, assist them with reading, assist them with grooming, and as well as the preparation or for what we call a light meal or snack. We are not talking about cooking cocoa and red herring and, and those kind of things. But somebody who can prepare a, a, a sandwich mm -hmm. and so on, as well as a cup of tea. Some persons might be interested in playing some card games. And that is very helpful too. I've encountered some sit, uh, seniors who when you first saw them, they were literally crumpled up in a corner. And now they're at the windows looking out to mm -hmm. see when the companion are coming to be with them. So this program addresses that. We have been finding as well a number of situations which require referrals to other agencies. And of course, the National Assistance Board has a team of social workers and referrals are made and they conduct visits and sometimes address issues that the uh, companion program cannot address directly. And then with respect to um, the issue of elder abuse, we have Mr. James Cummins, who is an expert in that area. Mm -hmm. He is very highly trained and highly knowledgeable and skilled in that area. And he is able to make an intervention to find out exactly what is happening with this person. As you know, persons who are abuse are not always willing to come forward and say it, but a neighbor can, uh, can observe or suspect that this is happening. Or it can be the doctor, it can be the nurse at the body clinic, it can be anybody. And you might not know for sure, but you can say, Miss or Mr. So-and-so down the road, I suspect mm -hmm. that something is happening. 
I, I want to come back to mm -hmm. the elder abuse aspect a little yeah. later, but mm -hmm. just to focus a little more on this companion program, yes. what's the biggest differentiation between this program and the home health program? All right. The biggest differentiation, I would say, is that while the, whereas the home health service is engaged in the cooking and the washing and the scrubbing and the administering of a bath and so on, the companion program address a different level of need, largely the loneliness and the isolation okay. and the social stimulation. I must say that the home help service can address some of that. They don't have the time because they, sometimes they have to go to three or four persons in any one day. And therefore, if you are going to be house cleaning and cooking and washing, you do not have the time to sit quietly with the elderly person and engage them in conversation. And as you can suspect, sometimes we, are, we tend to, to dwell on things in the distant past because our long-term memory is, is still so sharp. And seniors need people to sit with them at a leisurely pace, and they, they do not like you to be rushing them. In other words, if they're going to be making a sentence, they expect you to listen. They don't want you to finish the sentence for them and so on. So basically that is the, the difference. And I like to say to, to, to the companions, as I've said to some of the home help um, administration, that it is a complete service, really. And we're in this together. So you have situations where the companions are aware of situations where elders need the home health service more so than they need the companion program. And similarly, persons who are receiving the home health service. I dare say that there can be situations where a person is sufficiently better able to cope with themselves and therefore might need not necessarily the hard core work that the home helpers are doing, but that the companion program can do. So I like to see it as a backward and forward level of referrals, where it is a team approach and it is all an effort by the government and people of Barbados to ensure that we do all in our power to create the best possible quality of life for not only seniors, but others who are not seniors, but who are vulnerable and in need of that service. It seems like a lot of work for just 15 supervisors. You said each one would have two constituencies. Yes. That seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work and each uh, supervisor will have 15 persons in each constituency. So on average, you have about 30 persons. Mm -hmm. And persons are assigned, and that supervisor must traverse those two constituencies. Some have, would have cars, and some travel with bus, and some travel on foot in order to ensure that the companions, one, arrive at time. It is a nine to five program, arrive at, on time, and that they're doing what they're supposed to do. The application form has a number of boxes that you fill whether you need some light cleaning, some light cooking, grooming, whatever it is, and you take those boxes. The good thing about that program too is that that form has, uh, you compile a medical profile, so to speak. Is the person diabetic? Is the person hypertensive? Suffers with arthritis? Has an amputation or two? Is visually impaired? Um, and we do not like to, we, well, we do not encourage them to make any diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's was the part of the, of the dementias, but that you can say a person is having lapses in memory and those kind of things and our person might, might not be able to focus on any conversation. But we do not want persons to come in contact with a person and, and declare that the person has dementia or Alzheimer's because the only competent authorities to do that would be the medical folks mm -hmm. and so on. Now, you mentioned the application process. How easy is it to apply? Can I apply online? Do of I have course. to come to NAB? You can al also um, telephone the National Assistance Board, the Elder Care Program, the direct line there, 535-1860. 535-1860. Or the traditional number for the National Assistance Board, 535 3131. 535 3131. And someone will, of course, take the information and 
we pride ourselves on saying that once uh, a referral is made or an application is made, that within one week, sometimes it is 48 hours, a visit is made in order to uh, assess that person and get the service to them as quickly as possible. So you call ahead before you come in for the forms? I just wanted to be clear. You mean the public? Yes. No, no. The public will call mm -hmm. and give a name, address, telephone number. And then the supervisor will go okay. out and make the visit armed with the, the form as well, and to fill that form out. No, you mentioned elder abuse earlier, mm -hmm. June 15th. That's yes. celebrated as yes. World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Let's yes. look at the issue. How big of a problem is it here in Barbados? I think it is big enough for us to be concerned about it. How concerned? Um, the, the problem is that you will never know for sure if a person is being abused. And there are many categories of abuse. It can be physical abuse. It can be sexual abuse. We talk now about financial abuse. It can be emotional abuse. And you would never know for sure how many people are abused because the persons who might be abused, doing the abusing might not even be aware that they're abusing the person. For instance, let's deal with one that is um, not so easy to spot but which is fairly prevalent. I hear um, people say, once a man and twice a child. I hate to hear it. I hate to hear it because if you have the attitude that you are once a man and now you're a child, it suggests to me that you are, you, you are, the assumption is that this person now must be treated as if that person is a child. Mm -hmm. Seniors don't like it. Now, and therefore, some family members might take decisions that directly affect this person without even consulting them. We know of, and, and this is not a majority of cases, but we know that there are some situations where a senior, an elderly person is said, oh, we're going for a drive, or we're going to visit this place and the next place. And next thing you know, they turn about a nursing home with them. And to me, you couldn't want a more grievous sin than that. So as well as managing the person's resources, and this is a very um, galling kind of issue where a person is entitled to a pension, work many long years for a pension. And then someone will either force them or um, with the best will in the world, the senior person will say to them, but I cannot get to the post office. I do not have a bank account to put the money there. In any case, I can't get to the bank. But I want you to bring the necessary form and I will sign off on this that you will collect my check and you bring that check to me. There are instances where the elderly person does not see the money that is generated. And we know in some instances that the supplies that the person should be purchasing, whether it be um, traditional food supplies like breakfast or lunch items, or even adult pampers mm -hmm. that they are not brought. And when that senior person asks questions about it, they're treated as if they don't know what they're doing. And then the first thing the abusers will say, she has dementia or she has Alzheimer's. That hurt those senior citizens to the core. So the feeling that we can treat them as if they're no children it is bad because I will tell you something, because of my experience over the years with seniors, that their um, person can have episodes of lucidity. Mm -hmm. In other words, one, one day or one part of the day you're out of it, you're rambling all over the place. And another time you can focus on the situation. You hear something on the radio, you can respond to it, or you can speak about something that you experienced in the past. And therefore, we should never hold the view that because a person may even be diagnosed with early stages of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, that they don't know what is going on and that they are not rational, that they cannot hear, uh, recognize the tone of your voice, whether or not you're angry with them or whether you're treating them with contempt. So those are some of the issues. And 
people sometimes can slap older persons. I was going to ask about physical abuse. Physical abuse. Now we know that if we live long enough, we are going to become old. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we might not always be able to exercise control over our bodily functions. In other words, you might need to go to the bathroom, to urinate, and before you can get there, all tumble down. Now, there's some family members who get very angry about that and might even want to chuck about the person or even slap them about or even tell them, you know, how you can do this. And not realizing that bladder control is not what it used to be when we were, say, younger. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, people can be incontinent. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the bathroom. You feel the need to have a bowel movement. And before you can get there, because you can't control those sphincter muscles. You might have difficulty tolerating some food items that you did before, and therefore you have this. And I want to say to the public, bear in mind that this man or this woman was not always old. In fact, there is one writer who said that when we see elderly persons, we should have a vision of our future selves. In other words, if we live long enough, we are going to become old. And none of us can say for sure which of the non-communicable diseases will afflict us, whether it be our arthritis or hypertension or diabetes. We don't know. But each person, in my view, even senior citizens, are entitled to be treated with dignity and respect because they have this intrinsic worth which is theirs simply because they're human. So those things cause me sometimes, if there's something that will cause me not to sleep at night, mm -hmm. it is to think that what seniors are experiencing. Sometimes they're in a house and when rain falls, they have to dodge the raindrops coming through. And they have maybe children or relatives or friends who are aware that this house is in this situation and to take up the telephone and call an agency to say, well, Miss so-and-so down the road is 80 odd years or 90 and she's living in a house. I have seen a house where an old lady had to navigate. The flooring was so bad. She, there were planks across the floor and she was saying, well, you gotta walk on this, don't step there, don't step there. No senior citizen in Barbados should be experiencing that. And that is why this program is so important because we have the opportunity to not only bring this social stimulation, but also to spend time with persons and remind them that age does not mean that you are not to exercise your fundamental rights and freedoms. So, so these are some of the issues that we experience with the with the abuse. So it is the physical and it is the uh, emotional, the it financial. is the financial abuse. And neglect mm -hmm. is a big one. Mm -hmm. Neglect. I don't know how people can do it. You know, I, I um, was with my mother until she died at 93 a few months ago. So I know, and I like to say, the older they get, the more we love them. Because you remember a person who was hale and hearty who could walk faster than anybody else. And slowly but surely they become slower and more vulnerable, less independent. And then it is as if the whole scenario changes. Instead of that person being in charge of you, making the decisions and calling the shots, it is now that you have to do that for them. But in doing so, you must never assume that you can uh, deny them their right to self-determination. This is a big social work uh, principle. In other words, you can ex explain to me all the options that are available to me. Ultimately, I make that decision. And then if you do not agree with it, if you do not think it is in my best interest, well, it is my decision. And therefore, you just go back to the drawing board and engage in conversation until you can get there. But the view that because a person is old, you can decide for them and do for them what they can and would like to do for themselves, that is not it.
No, you also mentioned to me off camera that the NAB would have received reports like old people being locked in their homes for oh, yes. whole days. Yeah, that is that is another terrible thing. And I understand why some people do it, but mm -hmm. it is wrong. Mm -hmm. It is not the most appropriate thing to do. Yes, there are persons who will tend to wander away from home. Because some seniors, given their mental profile, can be restless and easily agitated. Or a person might have grown accustomed to going wherever it is. And just wake up one morning and feel that I am going to go down to Miss Jones, I'm going to go down to church, I'm going to go someplace. And the relatives, fearing that some harm might come to them. I listened to a lady speaking some time ago about her experience of going home and not finding her mother. And drive, driving all the way down to Spikes, standing up to Oysins and all of those places. Because her mother left home, got on the wrong bus, and luckily somebody um, recognized mm -hmm. her and called the relative. Now when you lock a person in the house, there's so many things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. First of all, if the person has any level of awareness that they are locked in a house, that is going to cause them some agitation. Mm -hmm. And of course it is going to make your relationship with that person fairly sour. I would say in those circumstances, Rather than lock the person in the house thinking that you are providing some safety, speak with your neighbors, speak with the social service agencies, speak with the social workers, counselors to see what you can do. Sometimes it could be a case where the, the person's um, health care providers might be able to recommend some medication that could help. But when you lock a person in that house and we know that sometimes there are accidents, there are house fires, that old person cannot get out. In 1976, the night the Barbados Labour Party won the government, there's a lady in St. Philip who would burn to death in a house. We, the boys, the young men in that community, had all gone down to Eagle Hall to that last big meeting. And we talked about that for years, lamenting the fact that if we were in the community, mm -hmm. we might be able to save that old lady and we were told people could hear the screams from outside but nobody could venture there so that they, their house fires. Similarly there are some persons who might turn the stove on and forget that it is on or turn the stove on and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. There are some people who might turn on the wrong burner and then something falls whether it be a kitchen towel or something depending on how you have your kitchen configured. And a, and a fire begin. Sometimes people die even before flame hits them because the smoke inhalation can make you drowsy, you fall asleep, and only the postmortem will show that you were dead even before you were burned. So I'm saying to persons, rather than do that, you're doing more harm than good. And that might be a shortcut, the easy way of dealing with a difficult problem. But sometimes we have to be prepared to make a sacrifice for the person's well-being as well. And I think that more agencies, more churches must preach about this. More community organizers and community leaders and community groups must, be, must demonstrate a higher level of consciousness of the seniors who live in communities with them. Look out for them, make sure that the son or the daughter who might be leaving at home and go out, that you can ask a question. There's some I know that um, my old lady would sit in that chair close to the door and people would pass and they shout out and she would shout back at them, mm -hmm. greeting. And that means a lot to those persons too. So they feel useful, they feel wanted, they feel part of the community. So we have a lot to do in Barbados, the government agencies, we've done a lot over the years. And I think that this community elder care program now has taken the care of the seniors to another level in Barbados. I am not aware that it, is, it exists in any other part of the region, but I do know that it is said that a country is measured by the way it treats its elderly citizens. So that as a collective, Barbados must feel that we have an obligation, we have a responsibility to care more 
and to be our, we say it all the time, you hear all the preachers with it, we must be our brother's keeper. But what does that mean beyond the words? I like to say that we must translate the rhetoric into meaningful reality. We do something not because the society will feel that we're doing something good. We do something because we know it is important and it has to be done. And we must inconvenience ourselves sometimes to look out for those folks. folks. Now you mentioned the various levels of abuse, the various mm -hmm. kinds of abuse. Mm -hmm. However, what if it's a situation, and you mentioned this briefly as well, that the caregiver is not aware that they're actually abusing the elderly or vulnerable person. Do you think there's need for perhaps a broader conversation? Yes. To say, well, look, I need some assistance with yes, this person. Yes, yes, yes. It's overwhelming. Education is important, and that is why in some um, sophisticated agencies, even in counseling agencies, social work agencies, persons can be so, let me use a common word, dumb press. Mm -hmm by having to deal with the problems and the issues confronting other people, that you begin, it begin to, it's a burden on your own shoulders. Now, we, the senior folks, know that sometimes those agencies should have a special counselor who will meet with those persons, discuss with the frustrations, and how having to deal with vulnerable persons day in and day out would weigh them down to help them to unburden themselves. But sometimes we don't, people talk about burn, a burnout, mm -hmm. but people sometimes don't recognize that you're gradually being sucked under by the many uh, issues that you're confronting every day. And I like to say to when I was responsible for um, supervising social work students, that you are taught, we were taught in our time, that when you leave this agency and you close that door, you leave all of those problems in there. You have a life too, you have family too, so that if you uh, cannot turn yourself off sometimes, you go home and you come back to work, instead of being fresh and bright eyed and bushy tail, you come in hardly able <laughs> to concentrate on your work because you have so, so many burdens on you. So we have to help caregivers to understand that not being able to cope beyond a certain level does not mean that you are not a good caregiver. Mm -hmm. It simply means that like all human beings, you have strengths and you have weaknesses. You have limitations. And we should not be afraid to say, well, you know, I've been dealing with this situation and I don't think I'm making the progress I should. I feel really sometimes despondent, demoralized, and you, there should be someone for you to speak to. Right. So my, my recommendation would be that every social service agency, every counseling agency, even in nursing profession, that there is some place in that organization where you could go and sit, maybe over a cup of tea or coffee, or something like that, and say, well, you know, I've been dealing with this and I have this number of case load and I don't think that I'm making the progress that I should, what can I do? And sometimes a person, that conversation can help. Sometimes a person might need a couple of days off. And that is why um, other agencies and other places, when persons work in these agents, this type of situation, they're given some time off. They're given and incentives don't necessarily have to be money or material gifts, but it can be some recognition. We know that you are doing a difficult job. We know you're doing the best that you can, and we appreciate that. Sometimes that means the world to people, but sometimes people are trudging along for years and years and years, and nobody says to them, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. You're doing something good, not only for Miss A or Miss B, but for Barbados. Staying with the issue of abuse, how closely does the NAB work with the police, for instance? In fact, I think, well, close enough. And I think we're ha we having a meeting coming up in a day or two to sharpen the relationship. Because sometimes the persons who are doing the abusing will do everything possible to discourage you 
from bringing the service to the, to the person. And sometimes only the police can make a difference. I know of, of situations where persons move in with elderly persons without the person's consent. Yes, and those persons are so intimidated and so fearful that they cover in silence. And sometimes only the law can make a difference. Mm -hmm. The point though, if, if the law in, uh, enforcement agencies are called in, they too have to be sensitive um, to the situation because the fact that you call the police in does not necessarily allay the fears of the person because the police can't be there 24 seven. Yeah. And I feel therefore when that happened, protection orders would have to be given and an arrest warrant would have to be attached to the protection order. In other words, if you set foot, set foot within a hundred yards of this, these people's house, you're arrested. And we need to become more sophisticated I know I've mentioned more developed countries, but look how many instances where a caregiver was left with children mm -hmm. or a senior citizen, and the relatives had reason to put up a camera. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, look what they found, that people were beaten from pillar to post in the communities. Children were thrown about like rag dolls and so on. In fact, there was a case in Canada some years ago involving a, a Bajan um, caregiver who was tossing about a child like a, like a rag doll. So that we have to be mindful that if we have seniors and we have caregivers, there's nothing wrong with going the extra mile, spending the extra dollar or two to set up a surveillance system so that you can, be, you can know for sure. And in all fairness to caregivers, I would say that sometimes, dependent on the mental state of the senior, a person can say that something was done which was not done. Mm -hmm. So you have to, both sides of the coin you have to explore. It could be sometimes that a person experienced something many years ago and there's some level of uh, regression or some level of projection. And a person will uh, relive that situation and might speak about it today 30 or 40 years into the future, when in actual fact it is something that would have happened in 1960 or 1970. So it is not uh, an easy task. And those of us who are trained in the area know only too well that you cannot rush to judgment. You have to get um, as accurate a profile as possible. And the conversation can help because you can have a conversation for five, 10 or 15 minutes, but you won't you you get any information that's reliable. You need to have the, the patience and the understanding and the skill to get to the meat of the matter. Because we talk sometimes about the presenting problem. What a person tells you is the situation. But you know that's not the real problem. Mm -hmm. The real problem could be layers and layers, in fact, doctor, Bannister of blessed memory, Pat Bannister, used to say that getting to the core of a problem sometimes is like an onion. You peel off layers and layers and layers until you really get to what the issue is. So this business really of, of caring for the elderly is not for the faint hearted. It is not necessary for people who want to make a quick buck but it is for people who genuinely care and who are able to, who are trained to observe and to make interventions that matter. For instance, I like to say to them as well in the training, do not contradict, do not argue. You make a bad situation worse. Mm -hmm. So all of these are little tips and little uh, approaches that can help. But all I would say is that I'm happy that the government of Barbados has seen fit to introduce this program. It is aimed at improving the quality of life of our citizens, our seniors. And when we look at what the sacrifices our seniors would have made, a lot of the people in their 80s and high 70s and 90s, these are people who really came up and did not have the opportunity of the education we have today. 
And there are people who work from morning till night because they had children. And they knew that they were receiving wages that were not adequate, but because they had children to support and they had children to educate. These are seniors who sometimes with ill health, continue rainfalling, sun shining, and they're out there working to put us where we are. And I feel, really feel strongly that some of us do not appreciate those sacrifices. Maybe we don't talk about them enough, but programs like this, hopefully, can cause people to reflect on the fact that this little old lady you see here in this corner, or this window sitting down, and looking out, or this man you see. These were not always uh, vulnerable. They were not always dependent. They were once vibrant, um, well-rounded Barbadian citizens who made the contribution. And in the evening of their days, they deserve to be treated with honor and respect. Does the NAB have any mechanisms in place to deal with perhaps negative reports of supervisors yes. acting inappropriately mm -hmm. when they go to clients? Well, once a report of that nature comes in, it is treated with a high priority. Um, I spend some time having to deal <laughs> sometimes with, with little differences of opinion, I call it that, mm -hmm. to be euphemistic. But a person might step out of line and the supervisor might not be able to address it effectively. It is referred to me. And very often Mr. Cummins is in on that meeting. And we will hear both sides and sort the matter out. And I can tell you that we have in excess of 500 elders out there in the community receiving care. And about 320 companions. We project that by the end of the year we should have about 800 or 900. But I can tell you that any companion who ill treat any of the elders are vulnerable persons. That is not going to be tolerated. You know, and um, yes, the laws of natural justice say that you must hear both sides and so on, you must do that. And that's why we stress documentation, documentation. Because any person who ill treat the elderly will be severely dealt with, including giving them marching orders or involving the police. We are not going to have it because we cannot be the agency that is um, upholding the rights, the care and the protection of seniors, and then persons who are our members of staff, who are paid from the public purse, going out there and breaching those very, very rules and, and so on. So I can give the assurance to the elders that if you experience difficulty, we are here to deal with it. What do you want people to know about the hardworking men and women who serve as both supervisors and companions? Yeah. I would like the public to recognize them as people who are doing what a significant percentage of the public cannot do. For instance, you have your old lady, your old mother or father at home, you've gone off to work and you may take a lunch break and so on, you're having a good time. But we have these persons who are not the best paid persons in Barbados, but they have to get up every day and they have to go and work with your elderly persons. Sometimes they have to assist them with bathroom duties and so on. Sometimes, and I can tell you, some elderly persons can be quite cranky and argumentative and agitated. And you have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. You have to keep your calm. So I want to say to the public when you see them, compliment them. Recognize that they're doing a tremendous favor, not only to the elderly person, but the society generally. And that we need to treat them with respect they deserve. Don't think that because they, work, they, they have on a particular uniform or that they go to a house and they're, they're not paid like the average fellow who's taking home thousands of dollars when the month comes, that they're any less important. Every worker in Barbados is important, and especially those, the nurses and the doctors and the orderlies, the people in the polyclinics. And of course, we're talking here now about the National Assistance Board workers. They do work that some family members do not want to do. Some children of elderly people don't want to do, and that's why they're so far away. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we must accept that they're doing a tremendous job, 
and we should not wait until we have an opportunity to put a, a, a floral spray on their casket to say how good they were. We need to tell them we appreciate what you're doing and treat them with the respect that they deserve. How has COVID impacted programs like the Elder Care Companion Program, obviously with people going out mm -hmm. into the communities? Severely. In fact, when COVID, the first lockdown, the program was sort of accelerating and everything had to come to an end. And then we got back up and was rolling again when the second lockdown came. And by the time the second lockdown came, some of the seniors and the relatives of the seniors were very skeptical. Mm -hmm. They were saying, COVID is out there and we don't know if you can bring COVID into our families and therefore people who said they wanted the service decided that they were not going to have the service. They put it on hold. But we have encouraged our workers to be tested. So to you get had a cluster at one point? Yeah, that's a long time ago, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And since then, all of the protocols are, even if I go through the door, six or eight times a day, I have to sanitize, I have to get my temperature done. I saw the director do it this very week, stand up to be, have the temperature done and so on. So we are very careful. We uh, observe the distancing. In fact, training now, we don't do training in the conference room anymore. The Pilgrim Holiness Church down the road help us out because they have a large undercroft and we're able to use that. But we feel that we have to protect the seniors and each staff member is issued with the personal protective equipment. That is in the, the gloves and the masks and the shields and I call them booties, the things you put on your feet before mm -hmm. you go into the mm -hmm. people's house and then what you put on your head. Mm -hmm. So, and we insist that this is used because in cases where the seniors might not themselves be vaccinated or might not be wearing masks, we are going into their home and we have to make sure that we not only protect ourselves but we protect them as well. So COVID has been devastating. Thankfully, we are seeing the numbers continuing to trend in the right direction and I as a former nurse, I should say congratulations to the health professionals who stuck to the task. And for those persons who feel that the restrictions were onerous, I say it was for the good of the country. And yes, it was frustrating and at, and, uh, at times, but think about the country. And hopefully the economy will open up more rapidly than is the case. And all of those... Uh, Hospitality workers will get work. More of the elders in this community will feel comfortable enough to accept the program. And all of the persons who are registered with us would be able to get up every morning, go out to work and come back knowing that they have done a good job for Barbados. Thank you so much for talking to us, Mr. Griffith. I really appreciate it. That's Mr. George Griffith, the coordinator of the Community Elder Care Companion Program with the National Assistance Board. I'm Lisa Lord. Thanks for watching.